Now let's look at shading our map. What I want you to do is to come up here to this area, go add vector layer, browse, land use, 1971 to 99, open it. Okay, I'm just going to move it across closer to here because that's going to make it easier for me to show you stuff. So now click on this, left click and right click and we want to go to properties. All right, we're looking in this style tab. Okay, this guy here. Now the really important button here, or should I say drop down list is this. Okay, now there's three options in here that I'm going to talk about now. We have the option of shading by single symbol. So by single symbol, it basically means shade the map all the same color. Now, this option is really important if you're just doing simple map overlay. So for example, if you wanted to overlay this map onto an air photo, what you would do is you would go to the fill style, go no brush, okay? That makes the whole thing transparent. Go to apply and see it's um, it's now transparent. If we had an air photo or or some other map under under here, we could see the outline of these polygons uh, on top. The next one is graduated. Now, of all the uh, three categories that I could talk about, this is by far the most tricky. It's a shading technique for numerical data. So it will only work on columns that have numbers in them. So for example, how many people live in a particular polygon, where a polygon might represent a state or it might represent a county. For a farming map, you might talk about how many tons of fruit per hectare or per acre. Or for an environmental map, you might look at the density of critters per acre uh, and so forth. I think you probably get the, uh, the idea there. But there's a whole bunch of issues with this sort of data. Stuff like how many categories should there be? Now, this is a very tricky question because uh, that very much depends on your audience. For, for myself, where I'm generally communicating with decision makers and the public in, in most of the work that I do, I like to keep the categories as, as few as possible, generally around five, because uh, that allows people to, to very quickly understand a map. But if you're using a map for a um, individual project, for a scientific project or some such thing, where the, the category definition is really, really important, it might be important to have lots and lots of categories. Also, how wide should the categories be? Should they have equal intervals? Should they reflect the breadth of the data set? Or should they focus on a small part of the data set? Or how do you go about choosing an interval for themes that you need to compare over time. There are just so many issues with, sort of, uh, with this sort of data, and it's uh, far beyond a short course like this. And in my uh, full course that I'll be telling you all about a little bit later, I devote a whole three-hour lesson to dealing with these sorts of issues. What we're going to look at today is this guy here, categorized. This is, as the name suggests, shading according to categories or, or names. In our case today, things are, or categories or names uh, relate to various land use categories, things like uh, agriculture or recreation or urban uses. Now, if you were doing a qualitative study, such as a vegetation quality study or a land suitability study, the categories uh, might be something like, you know, high, medium or low. In other words, high, medium, low vegetation quality or a, an area of land is highly suitable or moderately su suitable or, or unsuitable for a particular crop and so forth. But this uh, categorical data, uh, in, in our case, land use categories, is what we're going to be dealing with today. Okay, so let's shade this map. 
we go up here, we click categorized. And what we've now got to do is we've got to choose a column to shade by. And we are going to choose some 1999. So these are the summary categories that I came up with for the year 1999. Now, what we do is we come down and click this button here and we go classify. If we then click the apply button, it will shade the map. Now, what I want you to do is experiment with some of these color ramps. What you have to do is you have to delete the existing one and then classify again and the new color ramp gets applied. We can then click apply to apply it to the map. Okay. So delete all spectral classify apply to the map and so forth. I want you to experiment with some of those. The other thing I want you to do is delete this last category because we're not going to need that. And what I want you to do now is to just drag and drop similar categories next to each other. So what I've done is I've got conservation at the top. You pick them up, hold your left mouse button down, pick it up and drop it. I've got conservation first, followed by open space, followed by uh, agriculture, which is already there, uh, followed by recreation, followed by infrastructure, commercial, industry, urban and urban support. And now what we need to do is we need to change the shading to a more attractive colouring scheme. Now here's an example I prepared earlier. Of course it's within this five-step challenge um, project file. Of course, you can open this yourself by going to open and open the five-step challenge uh, project file, but I'm just going to cancel that. I've used greens for open space related, uh, pinks for commercial related, oranges for urban related. Now, for me, this was inspired by a, a local planning document that we have um, in Victoria, Australia. But if you type into Google something along the lines of uh, GIS mapping standards, you know, a whole bunch of standards will come up. Um, for example, here's a local one, um, planning mapping requirements to specify colours, lines and symbols. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that will come up. And this has come up with, you know, 16 million, nearly 17 million results. So you're bound to find something there. Uh, probably you're better to type in GIS mapping standards for your own country. Another search term for Google would be map color standards. Okay, there's another one. Another option is colorbrewer2.org. And they have a whole bunch of different color schemes. You can type in the number of classes that you want. Uh, you can look at the color scheme. Uh, you can look at the hex RGB values are probably most appropriate for us uh, of the different categories. Okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that you can select. And if you run your mouse over the map, you can see that the uh, codes for the different colors comes up in a box. Okay, probably really important to us here is the RGB value of each of the colors. And RGB stands for red, green, blue. And if you copy down the red, green, blue numbers that are shown on this map, you can um, recreate those colors very easily in Quantum GIS. Another one to uh, be very aware of is this colorblind safe map. There's some uh, very interesting stories out there of uh, people getting the sack for producing maps that don't have all the themes on them, whereas it turns out the person doing their um, employment evaluation is actually uh, colorblind without them realizing it. This site is truly worth you uh, having a bit of a play with. But once again, 
these RGB values are very important to you. So if we come back to our quantum gist example, and what we do is we double click on the symbol with our left mouse and go to simple fill and we can choose our colors. So conservation, I have as a red value of 60, a green value of 138 and a blue value of 71. Okay, so that gives us our first green. I do the same for open space. My red value is zero. My green value is 170. And my blue value is 27. Okay, and one more. Look at agriculture. Double click. Click on the colors fill. And we fill in this information here, which my red value here is 0, 255 for the green, and 127 for the blue. Okay, and we can apply that to the map. And I'm not going to do them all here, but you can see that we've got all those there that those first three have come up. And what I can do is I can go to one that I've already got up, the five step challenge, and you can see that they're all shaded according to that color scheme. Now that color scheme, you'll find that in the handout, okay? Now there's something else that I want to show you with this. You'll recall that um, in an earlier video, I talked about the need to have a bunch of different polygons in the map so that we could represent land use change through time. Now, if we want to get rid of these black lines, what we need to do is to deal with our boundaries. So you can double click on, on that or right click on it and look at properties. One way around this problem is to double click on the symbol, come into here, and just go border style, no pen. Okay, the problem is if we click apply, what we end up with is these little white lines. Now they might be quite acceptable for you, but another approach is to just come in here and click on the border style and repeat the, um, the shading for the fill. So in this case, for conservation, it would be 60 for red, uh, 138 for green, and 71 for blue. Okay, we'll make sure we're displaying our pen and go OK, and we can apply. All right, the white lines have disappeared, and what we end up with is uh, just a, a, a continuous area of green, okay? And you could do that for all the other um, shadings as well. So doing this can make the whole map look far less confusing. Now the categories in this map have not been changed to reflect that uh, other, the properly shaded version, i.e. this one. But let's have a, a quick look at two of the categories, conservation versus industry. We've, um, we've changed the borders for the conservation category, and that of course looks far less confusing than the sort of thing that's going on here in this um, industry category, okay? It's just something you, uh, you might want to do if you're doing this sort of mapping. All right, I'll see you in the next video where we're going to be talking about using other GIS maps to validate the quality of this map. Right, see you there.